thank you for joining. Just a quick introduction. I think this is a, a very uh, interesting virtual briefing. It's, uh, it's a bit of a follow-up to a platform event that took place in 2012, a workshop in Berlin that organized with uh, GFAR, ASTI, and a few other partners. Uh, we brought together 20 to 30 participants in a discussion around the main challenges of uh, reporting and funding of agriculture research for development. Uh, not only donor funding, but more broadly as well. Um, and I think today's topic, looking at uh, how do we improve reporting of donor support to agriculture research for development, is, uh, is an issue that's of interest to many of us. Uh, it's a pressing issue. A lot of us donors have an intent to, to work on it. But I think the biggest challenge has been to determine what are those first steps? How do we start? And I hope today's conversation, uh, presentation and conversation can really help us. Um, so we'll start off with a, a presentation by the two uh, presenters, and then we will have opportunity to ask some questions and hopefully get into a discussion. And I really encourage you to try to identify um, sort of the next steps for us as a broader community uh, to, to advance some of the uh, points that will be brought up by the authors. So today's presentation will be uh, by Sinead Moulds and Phil Doby. Sinead is currently working as a consultant for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, she has a background in international development and food policy uh, and uh, worked with the OECD last year to release uh, that important note called uh, Aid to Food and Nutrition Security, uh, an excellent summary of donor support to that sector. And I encourage everyone to uh, go and look at that note. And our second speaker is Dr. Phil Doby, uh, a practitioner uh, in uh, agriculture and research for many years now, currently working as a senior fellow with the uh, World Agroforestry Center in Nairobi. Um, Phil's been managing research projects uh, in Africa and with the UN system and CGIR system for a long time, so brings a wealth of experience to this topic. So. Um, We'll, uh, I'll pass it over to, uh, to the presenters, Sinead, Philip. You have uh, 15 minutes to present, and then we'll, uh, we'll launch into a bit of a discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Nikita, for, for introducing us and for, the, for, for allowing us to use this platform to discuss these ideas. And thanks for everyone to, for, for logging in today. So this presentation, the, the few slides I'm going to put forward now today are very much based on, on the meetings which you mentioned in the workshop in Berlin last year and as well on, on the discussion around the brochure that happened uh, on this very platform last summer. In researching this work, uh, which, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we've come across a few different issues and in discussing the work, a few different issues. Pressing issues is, is the lack of definition for agricultural research for development and the common understanding of, of what that is uh, amongst the different institutions and donors. So that's the a, that's a first step to get over, but in fact, for as, as regards reporting the AR for, AR for D flows to the credit or reporting system of the OECD, there are two steps we can take immediately um, to improve the quality of the data and of the accuracy of the, the data analysis thereafter. So the different understandings um, uh, of AR for D means that the applications uh, are are different as well, and and this this is translated in the credit or reporting system through. Uh, a different use of purpose codes, for example, which means the analysis then uh, thereafter uh, will often have inclusion or exclusion errors and is lacking in accuracy. The, the different information provided as well is a reflection of, of the different understandings of ar 4 d But as I said, there are two simple ways in which donors can, can change the reporting. Um, and so I'm going to discuss that, those two set steps for the donor's perspective and then Phil, Phil Doby, who's been consulting with me on this for a few months, uh, will dis discuss the um, the, the implications of the r 3 d paradigm for researchers. So the two, two steps I'm suggesting we, we move forward with in, in the context of guidelines, I'm, I'm, I'm writing this will be the output for the work. The, the guidelines will be elaborating a lot more on this work um, with the objective of, of providing the information necessary for donors to, to harmonize and understand better the, what's needed to report to, to the CRS, the credit reporting system. So the first step is the use of, of, of just the code agricultural research. AR4D is actually less of a problem, presents less of a problem than many other areas such as food security because it does have this code that, that's ready to use for donors. So in focusing on one code only and inputting the data into one code only, 
uh, it allows us then to focus on the quantity of data, which is, a, is it's called the short and long descriptions in the credit reporting system, which I believe most of you know. Um, focusing on the short and long descriptions will allow us to harmonize but, but uh, address some of the issues of, of the, the different information provided and the lack of relevant information as well. Um, the template box, which I'm going to show you in a second, is is, uh, is what I'm suggesting for this. Uh, in order, so the, the the template box would be a part of the program lifecycle for each donor agency, um, and it would be need to be filled in by a program officer or director, um, with uh, with a view to the document or or where the, the project proposal document being available to the person who at the end of the the other end of the scale ends up doing the actual reporting to the CRS. From what I understand, that could be an intern or a statistician or a program officer indeed. At the moment, the short and long descriptions, they are very different between donors, but also within the donor institutions uh, in the information they provide. They're, they're much shorter or longer, and, and, and it, it's very difficult to, to gather any data on that. So the template box, perhaps one of the most important parts of it is that it, it would allow donors um, to report on the results and on the impacts, as opposed to just the inputs and outputs. It allows donors to express the different components of the program um, with the use of keywords and perhaps the correct terminology. Uh, and so this is the template box here. I hope it's coming up. It's not actually fully visible. Um, it is a it's a suggestion which is open to to any comments or feedback, uh, as are the guidelines entirely. Um, it's it's loosely based on the log frame uh, type tool in 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 the information we're requiring. And as I said, I will elaborate on this in the guidelines to, to specify exactly what we need information-wise. Um, the again, you know, some of these things may not be the most self-evident for an intern or someone who's not directly involved in agricultural research, which is where the importance of someone who knows the program filling this in um, would comes in. You mean type of research, for for example, it's not necessarily obvious that it's either an active intervention or creation analysis and that kind of thing. So. That's the um, that's the they're the two very simple first steps I, I suggest in 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 harmonising and, and and working off the same information and towards the same goals for the different donors. Uh, I, I know some donors such as Irish Aid have already started to include that purpose code in, in their program proposal stage, uh, and I think this is something we could do to 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 move forward and then tackle the other issues uh, the the broader issues around it as the other investment sites. So really what I'm hoping to get out of this discussion um, is to hear any feedback, any suggestions on, on what's most needed and most relevant for donors uh, to be able to use this kind of system, to be able to use a document that would be useful um, for in improving the, the quality of the data uh, to, of, of outflows to, to AR4D. It would also be interesting to know uh, to what level the existing CRS guidelines are being used and if not, why not? And uh, with the objective of creating um, a document, guidelines, information that is most relevant and, and most necessary at the moment to, to the donors. So this can happen. I, I look forward to that discussion now and in, in follow-up meetings. And I'm going to pass you over to Phil now, to, who is going to discuss the, the implications of this AR4D paradigm that is no longer linear uh, for researchers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me just very quickly explain um, why I'm sitting here. Uh, I am a senior fellow with the um, World Agroforestry Center, but I also have um, some academic contacts at Sinead University. Um, I hold a, an adjunct professorship there. So when I, when I put together the fact that um, I'm working within NICRAF uh, to try to work out how best we can respond to this new paradigm of agricultural research for development, which we, we believe to be something different from what we had, what we had before. Um, and when I learned about this work, I was, I was very interested. I must say my first response was to be um, slightly concerned, um, particularly for Sinead, that um, coding, coding for something which has not been particularly well defined in the first place is obviously going to Give a, a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a challenge um, to, to what we're doing. So what I thought it might be useful for me to do is just say a little bit about 
how far our thinking has gone on what practically do we have to do to change our research approach from what was happening before to something that we can call agricultural research for development um, and how that might reflect in uh, in how we record our input and most, imp most importantly in the long run, run how we actually report our, our impacts and uh, uh, the, the, the long-term effects of what we do. And I think it's the latter which actually is, the, is the, the hub of the problem. It's very clear if you start looking at the, um, for us in the CGIR I should say, if we start looking at the history of what led up to the, the, the most recent reform of the CGIR, it's quite clear that there's a, there's a concern that we've been too focused in the past on, um, the, on research outputs. In other words, uh, the things that a researcher can actually produce. This might be a new variety, it might be a new technique, uh, it might be a new, a new something. What we haven't been able to do to, to a sufficiently good extent is to associate those with um, impacts in the uh, in the longer term and in the larger scale. Because in the CGIR now, uh, we are expected to be demonstrably heading towards impacts in terms of levels of hunger, levels of poverty, poverty maintenance of the environment, and improvements in livelihood. So whereas at one time we could just have said, here's a great variety, go and use it wisely, um, we are now much more um, we're expected to have much more involvement in the longer term, longer term outputs. It turns out that um, the way we're doing this is to try to, um, to try to ensure that we have what are being called impact pathways, so that when we define our research questions, we also define some sort of understanding of how we're going to get from our research outputs to long-term impact. And we are perhaps a little bit simplistically being asked on the basis of that to start working with the range of partners. Um, and the implication being that in the past, we were basically stacking the supermarket shelves. We were taking our research outputs, putting them on the shelf, and hoping people would come along and use them. Now it's incumbent upon us to work with, with partners. Now, that actually is a very simple thing to say and a very complex, a very complex matter to put into, into practice. Because when we start looking at the, the theories and the science uh, of uh, adoption of research outputs, what we realize is that whereas in the past we've had a fairly simple linear approach to research, in other words, um, Norman Borlaug produced some varieties which were very good. They were taken up in India, they were multiplied, they went to the farm and it produced the Green Revolution. In fact, as our challenges become more complex, um, we find that it is very seldom that we have that, that simple linear approach to research in development. What actually we're recognizing now is that it's going to be very important for our research programs to position themselves into what are sometimes called innovation pathways. Others might refer to them as complex adaptive systems. What this means is it's a recognition that we don't have a straight line between coming up with a research result and an impact. It goes through an awful lot of feedback loops between our research output and between what happens. In other words, we'll put something out and someone will try it and an NGO will, will find something out about it and basically that will lead to an observation which will feed back so on um, and so forth. There are some fairly clear, I think, um, uh, implications um, for all of this. The first I've mentioned already is that we need much better research and development partnerships. So we're really looking, I think, for far better formulated projects which actually tie research and the development community together at a fairly early stage in, in our thinking. That has all sorts of implications for how we're funded and how we manage projects. There's not enough time to go in. Let me just flag that at the moment. We tend to use monitoring and evaluation simply as a way of ticking the boxes. Have we achieved the outputs that we said we would achieve? We really need to develop our monitoring and evaluation techniques much, much more assiduously so that we're shortening those feedback loops. We're understanding what's happening with our innovations. 
were able to respond to what's happening to the innovations to make changes, tweak the system, and get things uh, working, uh, working better. We've got to be much better at tracking attribution. Um, the, pro the problem with being involved in um, uh, innovation pathways, of course, is that there are hundreds of thousands of people involved. Who is ultimately responsible for a change taking place? Um, this is this is has always been challenging to to track. We need to get far better at the science um, of attribution. Um, this is leading us to a recognition that we, while we're we're moving ahead with the best will in the world and this, in the best way that we can to implement new ideas of agricultural research for development, we realize we're actually opening up a, a very large field here. And what we're doing in ICRAP actually is we're not only trying to think through the science of the changes that have to take place, we're, we're making um, institutional and organizational changes so that we can make sure that um, the, the organization of ICRAP is actually aligned with the needs of becoming an institution which no longer simply produces um, research outputs, but is actually getting stuck into this huge problem of how you move from uh, outputs to impact. Now, I think um, what uh, we've, we've heard from Sinead is a very, very good uh, first step in the donor community being able to focus on what they're starting, what they're starting to fund. We will be moving ahead. We will be going ahead and see if we really put some meat on these bones, turn these ideas into something that's very sensible um, and very concrete. Uh, in doing so, um, we'll be we'll be building up some partnerships to to help us. And anyone out there who would like to join us in these partnerships would be very very welcome indeed. So thank you for letting me gate crash this presentation and make those few comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Phil and Sinead, for this interesting presentation and the uh, high amount of information that you provided us in this short time. I'm sure that there are many questions that people want to ask. I can see that there's a question from Nikita. So, Nikita, over to you. Hi. Thank you very much for those uh, presentations. Um, really interesting work. I think you raised uh, uh, a number of uh, big challenges uh, for us. I, I struggled with trying to figure out sort of the next steps. Um, it's a bit of a chicken and the egg. Uh, Sinead, you're trying to introduce a set of practices that would help us try to bring a bit of clarity to, to how we're funding uh, and how we're tracking our funding for agriculture research for development. And then, Phil, you, you, I really appreciated your ideas. And, and basically, I'm trying to understand how, to, how do you bring greater complexity to, to the issue of, of agriculture research for development, or how do you bring uh, agriculture research for development into the complexity of agricultural development more broadly? Uh, so one is clarification, the other one is complex, complexity. Um, uh, I guess my, my, my initial question, and I'll, I'll be short, I'll probably come back to you, Phil, uh, but for Sinead, curious as to why you chose to uh, ignore um, agriculture extension, agricultural uh, education, uh, and focus solely on the ag research code. That's one of being one of the big challenges for us when we understand ag research for development. We try to bundle in sort of the broader uh, research and development value chain of, of, of uh, infrastructure, education, research, the knowledge generation part, and then also package in the, uh, the technology transfer dissemination component. Uh, so just curious as to why you left out those, those other codes. Um, and then I may come back to Phil uh, with a proper question. Thanks, Nikita, for, for focusing in on that because I, I didn't feel I had time to. It's an immediate short-term solution. It could be a solution in, in the long term if it worked. Um, there are so many codes that we could be using, even aside from agriculture extension. The problem is they, they, they don't stop at agriculture. They, stop, they, they should technically include, in some cases, forestry and fishing as well. Uh, the, the confusion that's already existent around the purpose codes and what AR4D is and it means that it's not it's not immediately possible um, to to distinguish which codes can and should be used for AR4D. And in the in the again in the immediate that this means a lot more agreement is needed amongst donors and for researchers as well. Whereas if we focus solely on agricultural research for development um, through the code 31182 of agricultural research, it allows us to give all the information we need through this template box. 
uh, including the, the breakdown, splitting the programs, which I believe would be easier if it was done in a quantitative format as well, um, to get all the relevant information in and, and for the, the research following on from that to, to be made more efficient and more accurate as well. Um, it, it, it's not it's not always possible. I, I know you were part of that discussion on food security, for example. It's not always possible because there is no particular code. There is the option of, and, and this has been discussed, as you know, to, to change codes or to you know, manipulate the codes. That, that's a much longer process we're talking about. And there are numerous problems, but the, the, the short and long descriptions are one major problem at the moment with the data. So if we could focus on that for now, I think it would uh, be a first step, as you said, you know, in moving forward, defining, understanding, getting maybe familiar again with the CRS through uh, results and impacts system as opposed to input output. So I'm not sure if that answers your question uh, satisfactorily. There you go. Uh, yeah, it does. I mean, it's, it, there's a practical reason of stick to the, the format that we, we currently use. And uh, it's a very pragmatic reason. Thanks. And this is David Radcliffe. I found the two presentations, and I'm on the phone, so of course I couldn't see any visual um, presentations, to be addressing two quite separate issues, really. I mean, one of which was the coding of um, projects involving agriculture research for development, and the other was really trying to trace where um, agriculture research for development fits on the, the impact pathway and the work that the CGIAR is, is currently uh, doing on, um, on inter intermediate development outcomes, uh, you know, linking the CRPs to these higher level outcomes. Um, I mean, perhaps the speakers would just like to indicate, you know, how these two things fit together. I mean, bearing in mind that research is being positioned more effectively does that have any implications for the coding of, um, of projects involving agriculture research for development? Thanks. No, it's, it's fair enough. I, th I, think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, we have stretched the topics a little bit. The point was made before, though, that we do have a chicken and egg situation. Um, we're very good in uh, the development field of actually coming up with labels and titles and um, um, ways of uh, um, ways of describing what we're doing. We sometimes don't have uh, a very rigid or tight definition um, behind them. Um, there's obviously an immediate challenge to see if if it's possible now to code for agriculture research um, for development in a more effective way than than research and development has been. Uh, has been coded for in the past. The problem which is raised there, in, in my view, is that we haven't actually really got around to defining what agricultural research for development means. Uh, it's one of these labels which is, um, it, it's, it's quite anodyne. We, we enjoy using it. Um, it, appears to, it appears to mean quite a few things. But if you look into the literature, there's very, very little definition of what's, the, what's there at all. Now, you, you're probably quite right that these are two different matters that, uh, that, should be, that, that could well be discussed separately. But when you have a chicken and egg, egg situation, it seems to me that this platform may actually be very well in looking at the continuity um, of what needs, what needs to be done. And it may well be that as we get better and better understanding what of how you do agricultural research for development, we'll have to we'll have to revisit a lot of the decisions that have been made at the front end on investment, describing investment and coding investment. Best I can do. Just to, to, to respond, David, thank you as well. Uh, the, the the link between the two here as well is uh, that the, the the problems with the CRS that that or or tracking ODA flows for AR3D. Um, they aren't limited to the CRS. They're, they're reflective in, in the entire m and &E system. And as the research has, has progressed, my, Phil, Phil and myself have discussed this. And in, in moving forward on the quantitative data, it's, it's not just putting aside the coding issue for now. It's uh, moving forward in, the, in appropriate terminology in the most important components of AR4D 
in the impact and results that, that we uh, that we expect from AR3D. And with the input and feedback from donors in producing even guidelines on that, I believe it can move from being guidelines towards uh, improving the overall m and of AR3D uh, with this being a starting point. I, I'm not sure if that's 100% clear, but, but that's just to add that, that little bit in there. Thank you. Thank you. There's another question from Nikita. Thank you, Christian. Just a quick follow-up. I think partly related to uh, David Ratliff's question. Um, Phil, in your talk, you talked about um, you know, how, how do we uh, define this broader idea of agricultural research for development and how we need to start embedding and integrating agricultural research and defining innovation pathways in broader agricultural development. Um, now, to, to draw parallels to Sinead's work, one of the advantages we have with, or one of the, the, the objectives of, of coding our, our funding is not only to find out how much we are doing, but how much we are doing relative to other sectors, um, and especially coming from a bilateral agency where we, we work in all sectors. Um, it's, the it's to the advantage of our, our, our senior management and political leadership to know how much on ag research compared to everything else. And so there is that, that need and desire to, to put it in a silo and say, this, this is our ag research portfolio, and this is our ag development portfolio, and this is our nutrition portfolio, and to know the relative amounts. I fear with, with the ag research for development, we may be bundling and integrating ag research and innovation and important things into uh, agricultural development. Um, I think that's important on the ground because I think we, we all recognize that that's needed to achieve the, the, the greater level of, of, of development outcomes that we're looking for. But on the side of planning a portfolio, it, it, it becomes challenging. And so I think that my question is, how do you begin to communicate this, this broader research paradigm and the complexity of agricultural research for development um, to the political level and, and begin to say, to them that there's a need for them to, to think out of their traditional sort of research development and then other sectoral boxes. Any, uh, any thoughts on, on taking it to that sort of next level? Thanks. And thanks for that question, because that, that is actually getting, getting very, very close to the, uh, the nub of the issue as, as, far as, as far as I'm concerned. I take your point entirely that there's a need to quantify um, at an input level, what has been put into uh, into a system? In other words, how much has been spent? Uh, people have to report to their parliaments, they have to report to all sorts of others on on, on, on what they're spending. The, what, what we also need, uh, in addition to that, though, is at the end of the day to get some sort of idea of the effectiveness of that spending. And of course, just coding the input does not give you much information about the effectiveness of the spending in the long run. Um, and that's a fairly broad issue that we could uh, we could discuss um, for quite a for, for quite a long time. The, what I think we have to avoid is doing anything which is too simplistic, which simply says we've got a new paradigm which we call agricultural search for, for development. Um, we know it's got something to do with impacts. We know it's got something to do with partnerships. So everything's all right, isn't it? We're now going to get the impact, and we're going to be able to report on the effectiveness uh, of, of what we're spending. Um, I think you've, um, at least indirectly, ra raised a, a huge challenge, um, which, which is that uh, once you start moving into innovation pathways and complex adaptive systems, um, you're talking about complexity science, and you're talking about some of the things which industry at the moment is struggling with. Uh, and trying to come to terms with, and trying to turn into uh, uh, into, into into managerial processes, and there is the result that um, you can swing from over simplicity to over complexity um, very quickly indeed, which brings bring, brings brings I think the um, uh, brings the uh, brings me to your specific question at the end of your introduction, which was how do you actually start how do you actually start getting getting this over. I think one of the things that we're trying to do at the moment is actually point it out in papers and publications and communications and opportunities like this to have discussions 
uh, with, with various fora that we do have a challenge in making agricultural research for development a paradigm which is different from and better than whatever paradigms we had before. The second thing is I think as research organizations, we are faced very clearly with the need to actually do research into what constitutes agricultural research for development. In other words, how do we ensure impacts from what we're doing? Uh, we used to be quite punished in the past if we actually took ourselves too far towards development. Um, we used to be told, your job is science, that the development people get on and do it. And now, in a twinkling of an eyelid, the more recent idea is, well, actually, you have to work with the development community, and you have to, you have to help them to, 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 to actually arrive at some inputs. At the heart of this, this these are not trivial changes. These are changes which are going to, you know, they're going to require people to behave in ways that have not behaved before. And that's not only the researchers, not only the development community, it's, it's the donors. So I think we first of all have to communicate the problem, then we have to do very careful research into understanding the problem, simplifying it, and making it operation. Thank you. Any more questions coming in? Thanks, Christian. Yeah, it's Ernan here. Um, uh, thanks very much for the presentation and uh, and for organising the, uh, uh, the discussion. And um, it, um, I mean, I, I think there are a number of things we're we're, we're discussing uh, here, uh, or the discussion has, has brought in. But uh, I think that the from Sinead's initial presentation that the idea really is is about improving uh, the reporting of what we do uh, in research in agricultural research um, and uh, getting better information um, available on what actually is being funded um, uh, and what is taking place. Um, and that's kind of different from um, coming up with an AR4D concept, in a sense, you know, um, uh, and maybe getting a, a code for that. You know, in the end, um, yes, of course, there is value in being able to say, we're spending so much money on agricultural research, uh, so much ODA on agricultural research, and there will be value in saying, uh, yes, we're spending so much money on this concept of agricultural research for development. But also, I think we want to be able to not just look at what we're spending on research compared with other areas. We also want to look at, a bit, with a bit more granularity, on what is being done in the research itself. Um, and uh, so being able to see how much has been spent on different crops in different areas uh, for different target groups um, or whatever. Um, and it seems to me that what Sinead was proposing in terms of uh, some standardized approach or guidelines for, um, uh, for reporting um, uh, under the CRF system, reporting the short and long descriptions, is aimed at trying to do that to get better uh, information into the system, which can then be used for analyzing what actually is being funded. Uh, that's quite, as uh, uh, Sinead described, how that might uh, uh, be done in who it would involve inside donor agencies to implement such a, an approach in terms of getting more information into the reporting. Uh, and it's, it's potentially reasonably onerous, I suppose. So what I was wondering about was, you, you, what you're proposing is uh, coming up with uh, a guideline um, or an approach, a, a common approach to uh, providing information into the CRS system under the descriptions of the projects. And you, you showed us that, um, uh, that uh, framework or template as, as a way of going about it. What I was wondering was, do you get any sense of, um, uh, of demand or interest from the donors uh, in actually um, doing the work involved in, in implementing something like that? Thanks. Right, thank you. Uh, I've had some feedback over the last few months um, and some responses. Generally, there's a lot of enthusiasm but a lack of time to fully invest into it. So that's why I've gone ahead with the, the template and, and the suggestions. And I'm looking for more, more input and, and more clarity on what's needed. There certainly has been enthusiasm, yes, to, to, for simple changes, for, for steps to, to, to take to move forward in improving the reporting. Part of the reason, as, uh, as was part of the discussion, as you know, was to keep it as, as simple as possible. And, and, and that is, 
really the the work involved, the time involved, that's one of the reasons why they are such immediate and simple steps. And I, 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 I believe that once we move forward, if we were to move forward with this, then the information we would have would indeed allow us to move forward then in in understanding more about ARFD and, and how to track it and how to monitor and evaluate it better than we're doing at the moment as well. Okay, thank you. Um, we have time for a last question. Hi, this is Mumokshu from the Gates Foundation. Um, actually, it's just a question to follow up on earnings is, um, you know, uh, we are interested in uh, like a AR4D guideline so that we have a standard against which we can start reporting, which is going to give us more a better understanding of the granularity of what is constituting ag research. But I'd like to know if the other donors, like uh, Sin and who else you've talked to, who expressed interest in doing so, because um, sometimes, you know, like we discussed, when you have a more granular approach, it becomes slightly more transaction cost heavy in many instances to r report against that sort of a guideline. And uh, what would be the appetite for other funders to take that on? Hi, Mamushi, thank you for that. Uh, I've had responses over the last few months from um, the ASCII, from Nikita himself as well, who's expressed enthusiasm in moving forward with some kind of solution. Um, I've been in touch with USAID and the World Bank briefly as well, and with a few other institutions. This, this, this meeting, this virtual briefing, um, the presentation, the work I'm putting forward now is something I really, really hope to build on from, from today onwards. And I, I hope that the donors will be more encouraged to, to suggest on the practical side what, what's needed after seeing the template and, and understanding that the guidelines are happening. Um, so that's, whilst the enthusiasm is there and was at least for the last 18 months, since, since January 20, 2012 at least, uh, this has been, dis has been discussed and, and, and Solution. People are looking for solutions. But from what I understand, the resources are missing, and especially the time is missing to have someone to invest into the practical solutions. Thank you. Then, by looking at the time, I think um, we can we can end the meeting here. I would like to thank both presenters for the interesting presentation and all the participants for their interest and uh, time to participate in the platform secretary's virtual briefing. And uh, would hand over uh, to Nikita for to, to end the meeting officially. Thank you, Christian. Yes, and I'd like to just uh, again thank the two presenters. I think um, some of the conclusions I've I've drawn from this this virtual briefing today is that uh, there is definitely value in us working uh, on some of the more short-term, immediate-term tasks, um, especially the work of Sinead. Uh, to clarify how we use the codes and provide a few uh, suggestions is, is very valuable. And at this point, I'd like to encourage everyone to send uh, any additional comments uh, to Sinead's three questions directly to her. I think her email address should be uh, probably on the, the platform uh, website. Um, and I think Sinead may reach out to uh, us donors to, to get a better sense of how we are uh, working. Um, on the more medium long term, I, I do see though that uh, following up on some of Phil's comments, it's going to be a longer term process, um, a, a more of a journey, an evolution in how we uh, interpret and understand um, agriculture research for development. Um, definitely a need for a better defining of the term. Um, that evolution, one of the ideas I had, and kind of throwing it out there, uh, is, is sort of a parallel system where we have tracking of, of, of inputs through our codes on one side, but perhaps an evolution where we're headed towards uh, a set of common outcome statements where uh, agriculture research for development could be better defined um, and would allow us to bring in a broader set of partners, not only donors, but development partners, private sector, uh, who may decide that they are working toward this kind of broader set of objectives. Um, now, of course, setting up a parallel process is, uh, is challenging and probably a bit dreamy. Um, and finally, I'd just like to speak to uh, communication. Uh, Phil said there's a need for us to continue communicating and, and talking to one another um, about these issues. I really think there's value in also in getting our higher level, political level, um, uh, communicating around this issue. I've noticed a distinct lack of very high level events 
where uh, political leaders can get together and talk about research. There's been a number of them on nutrition, uh, a number of them on, on private sector investments, some high-level events around safety nets and, and, and humanitarian aid, but there has not been a, a ministerial type of event involving or on a thematic of agriculture research for development. And that might be one um, idea I'd like to just kind of throw out there. Um, finally, I'd just invite you to the next teleconference of our Agriculture Research uh, for Development Working Group. Uh, it's going to be in the next few weeks, I think the first week of May, and uh, Christian will be sending out uh, invites. Um, and we hope to um, determine the interest of donors in pursuing this subject and uh, perhaps discuss the next steps based on uh, the conversation here today. So with that, finally, I'd like to just thank, uh, again, the two presenters and uh, everyone else for participating and uh, for um, uh, coming to this virtual briefing today. And thank you to the Secretariat for organizing.